Our guest today is Dave Pounder, a retired adult film producer, director, and performer. Dave is the executive producer of the documentary film Risky Business, a look inside America's adult film industry. He is also the author of Obscene Thoughts, a pornographer's perspective on sex, love, and dating. Dave joins us back on Savvy Today to discuss sexual liberty and the government's part in protecting our sexual liberty. Find out more about Dave and visit his website today at DavePounder.com. Hi, Dave. Welcome back. Our return guest here, Dave Pounder. He is the uh, executive producer of Risky Business, an inside look at America's adult film industry, an award-winning film. And you're coming back here today for our, our Heartbeat of the World video series where we're talking about challenges across the United States and the world. What are some of the greatest challenges? And you were one of the wonderful people who filled out our survey. Um, and one of the things you had a concern about was government lobbying and how does religion play a part in the rights of, of people and sex and sex workers and such like that. Um, so before we go to all of that, just share a little bit for our audience who might have missed our first interview, a little bit about your background. Uh, grew up in, well, actually born in London, grew up in Michigan, went to Michigan State, studied finance and accounting, worked for GE Capital for two years, did a master's in business, concentration information systems at Arizona State, worked for Wachovia for a couple of years, building credit risk models, fell into the swingers world, got into porn, quit the bank, <laughs> uh, was a performer for a while, then started directing, then started producing, um, then I got engaged, so I got out of porn and moved to Indiana University to study human sexuality, where the Kinsey Institute and all this stuff. Um, Hated the cold, so left that down to Miami. Love the heat, so I've been here ever since. Um, I wrote a book, uh, Obscene Thoughts, A Pornographer's Perspective on Sex, Love, and Dating. Uh, ObsceneThoughts.com, by the way. <laughs> it, uh, it won an uh, a, uh, award at the American Library Association Conference in 2013 for psychology nonfiction. It's been a bestseller on Amazon twice. Um, I have the documentary, Risky Business, a look inside of America's adult film industry, RiskyBusinessTheMovie.com. That won a bunch of awards in the film festival circuit. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, so now I'm just here yapping, talking to people about <laughs> sexuality and politics and everything yeah. else that's fun in life. I know. It, it, we had a fascinating first conversation. I know we're going to have a fascinating second conversation. Um, but I wanted to kind of pick up where we left off. We were talking about how, as a developed nation, we're very puritanical from our beginnings where we kind of started with a very religious center point and how much that has played a part in a lot of our policies and, and laws in this land and the way people respond to certain things. Um, but where I was thinking about, and I thought about this this week, is how much do, because, you know, in the past we had kingdom and churches ran kind of the people. And now we kind of have a government um, body, and it, whether it be local, federal, whatever, and they kind of pass down the rules. What I was thinking about is our puritanical views really based so much on kind of a righteousness idea, or is it really kind of a way for the people running things to keep the smaller people in check, more or less? What's your viewpoint? Well, I think it's a little bit of, of both. I mean, first I would question the premise, <clears throat> which is that mm -hmm we started as a uh, sort of religious puritanical society. I mean, I would, I would think in, in, in England that was the case. I think we yeah. escaped that <laughs> to get away from that, which is why Thomas Jefferson talked about a wall between, uh, you know, uh, government and church, basically. Um, so what's interesting is that England, who we left the church, has become more secular than the U.S., who was founded really on getting away from religion and now has become one of the most religious developed nations that, that's around still today. Um, as far as... Um, How did that happen? Why do you think that happened? I, I don't know, <laughs> but it did, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the thing is, is, um, you know, I, I, initially I used to argue that religion was crowd control in a sense of saying, you know, we didn't have birth control. We didn't have all this other medical technology. And we didn't want, you know, women couldn't work. Women were not allowed to work. You have to stay home, raise the kids, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you were a woman and you were sexually mature at say 16 mm -hmm. and, you know, you were having sex and you had a baby, you couldn't control that. A lot of guys weren't going to come around and marry you because you either weren't a virgin or they didn't want to invest their resources and the offspring of, you know, a rival male, et cetera. And that person was destined to live with their family forever and be a burden, basically, if they had a kid back then when, when, you know, it, when the virginity thing kind of mattered. Um, so I think that you just have this. So I think in a way it was kind of the church was good in that sense of saying, mm -hmm. don't have sex, don't do this, because it, it was good for sort of social policy. Yeah. Um, and then once medical technology caught up, 
then all of a sudden it became problematic because, you know, they're telling people to feel bad if they have sex when they're young, or if you're gay, feel bad. It's in the Bible. It says this. <clears throat> and I think it's like Christopher Hitchens says, I think religion poisons everything. Mm. Um, now, so yeah. So, I mean, I think there, there's an element of, of crowd control that comes from religion that kind of transferred over to government. But, you know, we do have elected officials. You vote, you vote your people in office and they collectively vote to pass the laws. What's interesting is I've lobbied for a couple of bills myself because I'm a total nerd and very politically uh, you know, involved. And um, every time I would go to a representative's office or a senator's office, and this is at the state level. I did do some federal stuff, but very little. Mm-hmm. It was always almost, well, I would say maybe 25% of the time, which is random because I'm just going there for one meeting, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody else waiting to speak with the legislator was from a church. They had a Church of Christ thing or, you know, whatever it was. And it was almost predominantly Christian. I didn't see a lot of like, you know, obviously Islamic people or even Jewish people. It was always from a Christian church. And I just noticed that religious organizations, especially Christian organizations, tend to be very well organized politically, almost like the NRA, the NRA, Planned Parenthood. All these organizations are, are well connected politically. Um, and, you know, and I wouldn't have a problem with that if their ideology wasn't counterproductive to social progress, meaning, Mm -hmm. you know, lawful regulated prostitution, no discrimination against gay people, transgender people, whatever people want to do in the bedroom, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I kind of agree with, with Chris Hitchens when he says that religion (laughs) poisons everything. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I don't even know. I'm just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, No, (laughs) (laughs) no, absolutely. And it got me to think, we talked a little bit about before the interview about Deep Throat. It was a big, big film in the seventies. If anyone doesn't know, you can check it out online, but Harry Reid was Reeves, Harry Reeves, was one of the um, top actors. And he had got held up on charges and, and the charges were put forth by the FBI. And when I was thinking about that yesterday, I said, that's kind of nutters. It was the obscenity flaw. And I, I thought at first, why is the government playing a role in what people watch? Because that film and other films as such would not have been created without a market. So uh, apparently people want to go see it. So why are you penalizing the people who've created a product that the people want? Yeah, and, well, you could say anything yeah. about any vice law. I mean, you could say, mm-hmm. like a marijuana, why are you prosecuting, even cocaine, right? Why are you prosecuting cocaine people when <laughs> somebody wants to sell it, somebody wants to buy it, if it's a private mm-hmm. transaction, leave them alone? Because, you know, with cocaine, there's a, there's a negative social consequence. And there's this argument, again, that comes from religion, that porn or this mm-hmm. erotic material is going to have a negative secondary effects in society, which has been debunked by guys like David Linz at the University mm-hmm. of California at Santa Barbara, et cetera. Um, now it's not just Harry Reid. I mean, or Reeves or whatever the deep throat guy. Reeves, it was, yeah. <laughs> um, it was, um, you know, um, Adam Glasser was prosecuted under the Bush administration, mm-hmm. Bush, uh, the second Bush. Um, you had Phil Harvey, the, uh, president of Adam and Eve, <clears throat> which is an adult mail order. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, you know, they did condoms and adult videos, et cetera. And they did this multi-prosecution strategy to try to bankrupt the company, but they ended up winning in federal circuit court, mm-hmm. which is good. I mean, you had Larry Flint, you know, that was mm-hmm. prosecuted and he won at the, uh, that's much for the upsetting, but for the, for the, uh, for the, um, against the jury Falwell, the, uh, intentional emotional distress against yeah. the public figure, you know, he won against that at the Supreme court. But, you know, again, you always have, thankfully, you know, the mm-hmm. court system seems to be the only check on what I call American ignorance. So you have these people, mm-hmm. you know, that say, Oh, we're going to vote. Uh, all these people in that are going to do all this unconstitutional stuff, basically. And, and the courts have successfully, I think, in this country, been a good check on that. I mean, mm-hmm. the courts are the ones that desegregated um, schools. The mm-hmm. courts are the ones that allowed for interracial marriage and dating. Mm-hmm. Uh, the courts are the ones that allowed for gay marriage. The courts mm-hmm. are the ones that decriminalized homosexual conduct, Lawrence versus Texas. Um, you know, in most other countries, like in Australia, this stuff is done legislatively. It doesn't have to go through the court system. Mm. It's just regular people saying, hey, why, why can't interracial couples date? Why can't mm-hmm. someone be gay? Like, yeah, that makes sense. Let's introduce a bill. It makes sense. It passes. But, but those countries are much more secular than they are here. Mm. Um, you know, so I think if you're building a model, because you know, my background is in building financial models. So mm. if you're building a, a risk model or not even, like a predictive model to predict tolerance for sexuality, mm. um, I think the strongest predictor or the strongest independent variable is going to be level of secular pluralism within a society. So you look at a country like Amsterdam, which is high. I mean, most of the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Norway, Denmark, et cetera, are very sex positive mm. where you go to countries that are, that are high in religious religiosity, like Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, mm. these countries throw gay people from buildings and they, um, 
outlaw prostitution completely, and you could be killed if you are a female prostitute, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's directly correlated to the, it's not, it's not a wealth thing, because you could go to a place like Mexico or Thailand, which are not religious, you know, by comparison, um, <clears throat> and they have, you know, they're poor, they're unedu you know, less educated than, say, developed countries, and they don't throw gay people from buildings. They don't mm -hmm. murder prostitutes. You know, it's quite the opposite. In many of these places, it's lawful. So, because uh, for me, I always felt like, do we need a governing anybody telling us as adults how to be an act? I mean, we're adults. We shouldn't have to have a law saying you can do this or not do that. What is your solution for that? Is it really more educating the populace on, you know, being more tolerant or instead of passing more lobby uh, or laws? What do you think? What, what's your take on well, that? Well, education is always good. I mean, listen, mm -hmm. today, what is it, 2017? Mm -hmm. I live in Palm Beach County, Florida, which is a nice you know, one of the more progressive counties in, in Florida, which is borderline red state. And we still have abstinence plus sexual education in our school system here. Mm -hmm. Abstinence plus. Now the CDC in Atlanta. What does that mean exactly? Abstinence it plus. means that they don't teach comprehensive sex. So basically there's three levels of sex education. There's abstinence only, okay. there's abstinence plus, and there's comprehensive. And what the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, which is the public, government's public health arm basically, mm -hmm. <clears throat> has advocated for what's called the family life and human sexuality. I think it's called family life and human sexuality curriculum, which is a comprehensive curriculum, which talks about condom use, uh, you know, how to apply proper and consistent use. They talk about LGBT issues, et cetera, mm -hmm. birth control, all these things. Mm -hmm. Abstinence only doesn't talk at all about condoms. And if they do, they only talk about failure rates. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't talk about pregnancy statistics, all this kind of stuff. It's really more religious ideology of just don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's abstinence plus, which is something in the middle. <coughs> So <clears throat> what happens is um, here, even though the CDC recommends the, the comprehensive sex ed in every top public health program in, in the U.S., I mean, Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. UNC, Harvard, UCLA, Emory, you know, the top public health programs all advocate for comprehensive sex ed. And in Palm Beach County, Florida, we have abstinence plus, not comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if, you know, you elect these school board members that are, you know, from the community and they are, they don't want to be lobbied against by churches or religious organizations, et cetera, for supporting comprehensive sex education. Now you go to Australia, comprehensive sex education is the norm. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, it, there, there is no talk of abortion there. <laughs> there isn't, I mean, it's just, it's a non-issue. Um, are you saying that there's way less abortion because people are educated? It's not that there's less abortion, there's less, well, well, first of all, abortion rates have been going down regardless just with, because of the birth control availability and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, which is good. And I mean, most of the issues with uh, rapid population growth is in developing parts of the world, like mm -hmm. in Africa and places like that. That's where they really need access mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. those services. Yeah. Um, but um, in, in Australia, um, you know, there, because there's this, I mean, it's like Sam Harris says. I mean, there, there's a reason why in this country we talk about gay marriage and abortion and not things like poverty and genocide and things that really matter in, in sort of a political context of what we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that answered the question. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> but, no, but uh, I, ask, I, ask away. Yeah, I completely understand. It's, it's interesting because uh, thinking about um, when I was in high school, which is centuries ago now, mm -hmm. um, but really I remember it being more scientific based. Here's all the sex organs and all that. And, and here's what a baby looks like inside the womb and all that. And here's some birth control. Bye. I'm like, okay, what do I do with this? Yeah. And so you, you kind of walk out of the class with a basic science understanding of your inners or some guy's outers, but really not what to do with all of that. And not what the rep repercussions would be as a, a 13, 14, 15 year old. If I get pregnant, how is my family going to deal with it? And, and, you know, going through the whole system, because also I've, I've talked to people who've gone through abortion and it kind of is a traumatic experience, yeah. even, you know, sure. it, it, yeah, you do stuff to your body. So, uh, the comprehensive thing will lay everything out about what's going to happen and how to deal with that and, and how to use birth control properly. Correct. Well, I mean, the comprehensive talks about, <clears throat> they talk about um, everything that would be, you know, absence is a component of that saying you could do this, but they also say, or you could use condoms and mm -hmm. use condoms. Here's how you apply them. Here's the actual, you know, failure rates of condoms. This is the, the STD transmission rates, all this kind of stuff. But I mean, Google family, family life and human sexuality curriculum, CDC, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you should be able to find more information on that. But, but what I can tell you uh, absolutely is that every public health, respected public health institution, mm -hmm. including the CDC, recommends comprehensive sex ed. The reason we don't have it is political. 
Mm. And the problem is, is a lot of these polit- politicians are basically influenced by what they, you know, they call it like the, the, uh, a, a, a uh, minority of people that basically have a lot of political power because they're well organized. Mm-hmm. See, most atheists don't care. Like, I'm an atheist. I, just, I could care. I mean, like, I'm not going to sit there and call my other atheist friends and say, let's go lobby government or let's meet once a week and talk about why atheism is awesome. I mean, to me, the atheist church is really university, basically. Mm-hmm. There's a direct inverse correlation between level of education and religiosity that's been documented over and over and over again. If you look at the most religious parts of the country, they're also the least educated. Mm-hmm. And you look at the most educated, I think, I believe Seattle has the most PhDs per capita. They're also the most secular uh, area of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, same with <clears throat> San Francisco, places like Boston, Palo Alto, et cetera. Um, so there's no, it shouldn't surprise you that we're still doing corporal punishment lawfully where you can hit a kid with a rod for, in, in places like Alabama and Mississippi, but where that would never happen in San Francisco or Seattle or mm-hmm. you know, New York City. Um, wow, such varying points of view in, in one country. Yeah, well, it's a big country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. How do you bring it all together? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's really, really amazing. Um, but how do we, what's your, what would be your solutions to, because one, what I find rather sad about it is that on one hand, you see all these commercials, they kind of push sex on kids. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, go out there and get it. You're going to love it. But then they, they, they are going to love it. <laughs> they are going to love it. But, the, the, you know, but on the other hand, they're like, on the other hand, it's like, oh, it's evil and bad. So you're getting two conflicting messages as kids. Well, right. But, but who's yeah. it coming from? The evil and bad is coming from religion or, so or saying, politics influenced uh, by religion. And uh-huh. then the, the it's good is coming from just the social culture. Kids mm-hmm. uploading their own videos and, uh, you know, the, the corporate culture that knows what's, what's selling stuff. Yeah. But, you know, this idea, you know, sexual maturity is puberty, which is 15, 16, yeah. maybe even 14 these years. So people, arbit- the government comes around arbitrarily and says, okay, 18 is the age of consent or, you know, the age of whatever. Some states it varies, but let's say you're, tw- you're a 25-year-old guy, you have sex with a 17-year-old, that's statutory rape. Mm-hmm. I don't think it should be. I think that, you know, different people mature at different times. The mm-hmm. test should be, is this person sexually mature? Are they through puberty? I mean, people used to get married when they were 15 or 16 years old. Mm-hmm. And then the and, average onset of first marriage keeps declining now. It might be in the late 20s, I think it is now. Yeah. And what do you expect people just not to have sex until they're in their late 20s? Of course not. No. You know, so if somebody says, if the government were to come around and said, oh, okay, you got to be 19 to have sex. I think below 19, the statutory rape. Then the guy who has sex with the 18-year-old is now the, the pedophile. I'm like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's like people have this big thing on age 18 mm-hmm. versus 17 versus 20 or alcohol. You know, it, it just... To me, it doesn't make any sense. It's like you should, you know, you shouldn't have sex before you're sexually mature. Just like you shouldn't eat an avocado that isn't right. You know, sexual maturity is you know human rightness, if you will. Yeah. And you know, you wouldn't want to eat a, a a fruit that wasn't ripe. But if you say have a, if you have a ripe fruit and you go, oh well, I know it's ripe now, but you have to wait two more days until it's you know the fruit is seven days old. It's like why it's ripe? I mean, yeah. this doesn't make any sense. So. Um, I think that's an issue, but you do have to, uh, the answer to your question is, mm-hmm. um, I think that the, the political system we have here is good in the way that it's structured. Mm. You, know, you, you The people vote, vote for politicians, they're elected, they make decisions. I think the electoral college is actually good because otherwise all the weight would go towards the heavily populated states, you know, mm-hmm. so I think that's actually good, even though okay. Trump won, I can't stand Trump. But the <laughs> thing is, is, um, you know, um, so I think the solution is, just getting citizens to care. I mean, people just yeah. don't care. They're just, they're just, you know, they're just apathetic to the whole thing. They could care less. They're just uh, oh, whatever. I'm half the people don't even vote. You know? Yeah, you know what's amazing, Dave, is that I think often we've gotten used to this whole idea of just passing all of this off to a governing body to take care of. Oh, I'll just let my elected officials deal with it. I will just wash my hands of it. And the only time we concern ourselves when it comes to sex rights or any other rights is when it becomes a personal issue where we're being attacked or we have some issue in our family. But, you know, I, I would stand to reason that if we were to wake up and realize, okay, if I can start taking a stand on everything I believe in and bring it at a family level, because to me it, it's obscene that, you know, when it comes to sex, it's either – it's either really good or really bad. It really is neither. You know what I mean? It's really, it can be awesome, but it doesn't have to be good and bad. You know, it seems skewed. It's either one direction, really, really bad or really, really good. Do you know what I mean? But it doesn't yeah. talk about the middle ground. Well, it, where, depends on, it depends on the ideology. It's like guns, right? You got the people mm-hmm. who are pro-gun, anti-gun. Guns are really, really bad and everybody's going to die or guns are yeah. really, really good. We're going to keep everybody safe. And there's really, you know. It's no not gonna, really, yeah, it's not yeah. really really Or abortion or anything else. So there's, yeah. there's you know, there's, um, there's uh, any polarizing issue you're going to have the problem. But I mean, 
but the big problem is, is one, like you said, is education. You need more education, yeah. especially like in, 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 in uh, you know, like high school, teaching people about evolutionary psychology and just getting away from, you know, the religious dogma. Mm -hmm. And then there's, um, you know, it's interesting, like, you know, we have an election coming up here where I live in Boca Raton and there's an, a mayor and a councilman. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I know there's an election. So mm -hmm. I, I go, if who's on the ballot, I research everybody. What do they stand for? And I, and I vote for who I'm going to vote for. Right. And then you see people who put like a sign in the yard, you know, vote for Christina, right? And you drive by, you're like, oh, I guess I'll vote for Christina. Like, like who does that? Like, who yeah. drives by and says, they're at the voting booth and says, I'm going to vote for Smith because I saw a sign on the corner of this road and that road. And people do it. They're like, oh, I guess I'll vote for Smith. They don't know anything about Smith. So, you know, the way, that it, I just wish people would, would, first of all, don't vote just to vote. People go, you got to vote, you got to vote. No, you don't have to vote. <laughs> if you're not informed, don't vote. Yeah. You know, and the problem is then you have all these, these, you know, advertising saying, oh, vote for this and the fake, and then, <clears throat> you know, putting out false stuff, which I think is, is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfortunate that people just aren't, you know, they don't have enough critical thinking faculty yes. to go do their own research and figure out who they want to vote for. In a perfect world, you wouldn't even have to advertise that there was an election. It would be in the newspaper mm -hmm. and you say, oh, here's the election. Let me research the people. You go vote. The fact that you have to market voting, knock oh. on people's doors, please vote. I mean, it just, to me, I think that's unfortunate in society. I think people should proactively vote. Now, that's interesting to me because when, you know, the past election just happened, I asked a lot of people, well, who did you vote for? Why? And most people just had talking points as per whatever they heard on the news, on the news or newspaper yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, guys, did you actually go and look yourself? Did I, I, since um, I think the first push uh, that took us to war that I just clearly totally hated, right. I really started to get political then, started researching um, the law and what's going on. And it opened my eyes about how much we don't know and how much is going on behind all of our backs, but you know, not really because we're allowing it, but really you're so right. I mean, really get educated before you go out there and vote for anyone. I don't care if it's council member, president, uh, Congress, whatever. And it's sad that it's happened. Now, do you think part of that has to do with the education system? Because I'd heard years ago that the education system is really set up just to get us through, to get us to be working bodies for the, you know, Good well, working yeah. worker bees. Yeah, I mean, the school's got to teach your English and math and mm -hmm. science and stuff. But uh, no, I don't think it falls on the schools. I think it falls just on the parents and, you know, oh. community to get people to... Uh, what's made us complacent about our freedom and our liberty then? What, what's uh, done that? Media. I don't know. I yeah. feel like people are more active in other countries. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm, 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 you know, positing that if you go to Germany, that people are more uh, involved. Yeah, I was talking to this guy in Australia the other day, and he was telling me... Um, you know, I was telling him, well, tell me the differences between Australia and the mm -hmm. U.S. I'm thinking of moving to Australia. And uh, he's like, well, you know, we don't really have like 5,000 TV channels. We don't really care about like sports as much as you guys do. I'm like, it's perfect. Sounds like a perfect society. For me. You know, so they're, they're much more, you know, this guy was very well um, uh, in the know in terms of, you know, the politics and how the systems work. And they actually have a sex party, a sex political party. I should email you a link. Oh, I love it. That's funny that you can, uh, you can put up on this thing oh, yeah. um, that makes it happen. But it's, uh, yeah, no, I just think people need to be more wow. proactive about going out, researching the issues, and then going out and voting for who they want to vote for. And not, not it, you know, think about, I don't know how much you know about investments, but basically when you buy a stock, you want to look at fundamentals, like the price earnings ratio, the, you know, the, the earnings growth, all these different things, um, networking capital. But what happens is a lot of uh, people now, they join a company and they automatically get enrolled into their 401k. They're like, oh, you're now in the you know, general archery 401k. Mm -hmm. So now you start working and this money is automatically being invested in these stocks and say the S&P 500 if you allocate it to that, which most people do with the Dow 30. And what's happening is you're artificially bidding up the prices of these stocks, which takes away because you don't know, you're, you're, you're just automatically, all this money is just flowing into it. Nobody's doing any research. It's like, oh, S&P 500. So the S&P, like, I think the, I think the Dow is at like 21,000. It's like the highest that's ever been ever. And it's, um, uh -huh. but you know, the, 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 the fundamentals don't match to that. So I'm like, well, why is that happening? And I think it's kind of like that voting <laughs> instead of people, like if you, if you look at a smaller mid cap stock, those are probably accurately valued in the market because people are, you know, making the, doing the research and then voting or not voting, I mean, buying or selling the stock, which, re which, which reflects its true price. But you could have a company like, say, you know, Bank of America, which is a huge company in the S&P, I'm assuming the Dow 30. And it, it could be having the worst year ever. The CEO could be going around murdering everybody in the office. And everybody <laughs> would still be contributing automatically through their payroll to the 401k and the stock would keep going up. So it's, uh, 
I think it's the same thing that's happening where you get these bubbles in the mm-hmm. stock market. Yeah. This sort of, you know, um, money that's just being automatically, no, no matter what, diverted. And I think that's, that's what happens in our, in our political system is you have this sort of, the voting is no longer informed, you know, let me do this, do this. It, it's, it's marketing. It's how can I get these lemmings to basically vote vote for me it's like it's like uh you know it's like a popularity contest it's like oh, hey yes. don't vote for him he's a loser you know blah 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 blah, blah. oh i'm not gonna vote for the loser <laughs> i mean the job I mean, the joke is how did donald trump get elected i mean the guy had no political experience he's mm-hmm. throwing insults left and right i mean kind of everything flies in the face of how to conduct a campaign mm-hmm. but the guy was on tv you know he's yeah. purportedly rich which uh-huh. i still don't think he's a billionaire you know there's no proof of that. Yeah. But it's, uh, the guy's a showman, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's unfortunate that, forget Trump. I mean, I would have rather had like, you know, John Kasich or some level-headed guy, you know, yeah. into the office. But it's just, it surprises me that, that a uh, country could, could elect someone like that. That's just me. I mean, I might. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, I mean, and it's interesting. My grandma said way back when, when I was a kid, and I thought it was a little, ludicrous when she said it but she said tv has been the greatest destroyer of our country maybe it's not even education or the news yeah. maybe as my my grandma said way back when it's tv and what do we always hear about tv uh what your daily you programming and so what here you're you saying again <laughs> yeah you just sit here in front of this box and it tells you right. what to do and what to think and and before you know it you're thinking that all these things coming out of your mouth are really your thoughts and your beliefs but when I'd ask people, okay, why do you believe this? Uh, well, you know, because of the, 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 and it's not really their own thought. So right. I, I think where it starts here, where we're really going to probably end up our, our conversation, it really, really starts with education, education, educating yourself, being willing to go out there and ask questions and not just say, right. this is it. It's the end. I get it. And, and really just um, us and people who are more um, educated, maybe a, a little bit, knowing about a little bit of this and that, just going out there and sharing our, our um, wisdom and gifts with the world. Or destroying your TV. I got rid of mine in 1999. I haven't had a TV for what, 18 years? Let's really? see. Yeah, 18 years. Haven't had a TV. Not a single TV. I have no desire for TV. Not mm-hmm. on Facebook. Don't do social network. Like, it is the best thing. And everybody thinks I'm weird. I don't have a TV. Like, you don't have a TV? I'm like, why do you have a TV? And I go to their house. We flip. It's all garbage. Commercial, 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 garbage, commercial sports, commercial yeah. sports, commercial garbage. Like, I'm like, why do you pay for this? It's like, you know, it's ridiculous. And not only that. And not I, only I, that, I don't get yeah. it. I mean, this is the wrong yeah. country for me. I need to go to like Scandinavia. I know, and I know. Local. but it's also so negative based. I mean, I haven't had a TV now in um, three or four years. I got rid of cable and it was really hard at first. It was like getting off of detox, you know, it's like right. cold turkey. No, but it, it, uh, it really gets me to read. I read at least one to two hours right. a day. And so absolutely. Hopefully yeah. you're reading obscene thoughts. You betcha. Go out there and get it today. Let everyone thoughts. know again where they can get all your information. You and everybody else can get Obscene Thoughts at www.obscenethoughts.com. And there's, there's interviews like this on there, so go watch yeah. them and uh, yeah. you know, check you it betcha. out. You betcha. Well, I want to thank you again, Dave, for coming to share your valuable wisdom today on Savvy Business Radio. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. After five years of creating exciting business content with amazing businesses from around the world, Savvy is now creating a new video series entitled Heartbeat of the World. This series will feature experts from around the globe. We will highlight and discuss some of the greatest challenges facing the U.S. and the world. Co-create with us and find out more at bit.ly slash Savvy Patron. Savvy Business Radio and runs in syndication on eight AM FM stations nationwide, including iHeartRadio and six podcasting platforms. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or to become a guest and find out how we can help you get your message out in a bigger way, call 732-474-7375 or email christina at savvybusinessradio.com.